over a century, the BBC has been at the heart of British cultural life. However, little is known about the contribution played by women in its earliest days as producers, directors and engineers, among others, and how women helped to carry the BBC through the Second World War. Tonight, we'll be sharing the stories of just some of these pioneering women of the BBC and how Bournemouth University Research is helping to shine a light on these hidden histories. Here's what we've got coming up this evening. We have two speakers as part of tonight's event, Dr. Kate Murphy, who will be sharing stories of pioneering women at the BBC, and Dr. Kate Turkanian, who will be talking about the role women played during the Second World War. We'll then have around 30 minutes at the end for questions with both of our speakers um, before closing the event at around 8.30 p.m. We're using a platform called Crowdcast for tonight's event. For those of you who haven't used this platform before, there are just a few things to be aware of. Firstly, we're not going to be able to see or hear only our speakers will have their cameras and their microphones turned on. That means that the best way to interact with us and with each other is through the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and it's great to see some of you already using this to say hello and let us know where you're joining us from um, all the way from Rhode Island. Um, let us know if you're coming from even further, even further afield than that. Um, so please do use this throughout the event to share any thoughts, comments or observations that you have for each other or for our speakers. We also have the question and answer box, um, which looks like a, a speech bubble with a question mark inside. And that's where you can pose any questions that you have for both of our speakers to address in the discussion at the end of tonight's event. So please do use this throughout the event to share any questions that you have. And you can also vote on each other's questions as well. So if you spot a question in there that you'd particularly like to know the answer to, click on the arrow next to that question to upvote it. And we'll make sure we address the most popular questions in our discussion. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker this evening, Dr. Kate Murphy, who is going to be talking to us about some of the pioneering women in the very early days of the BBC. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, I'm delighted to be here this evening to share with you my passion for the history of women in the early BBC. It's something I've been researching for more than 20, 20 years now, and I thought I'd start by just explaining a little bit about how I got into this amazing subject. So before I worked at Bournemouth University, I was a producer at the BBC for 24 years, predominantly on the long running Radio 4 programme, Woman's Hour. Well, back in 2002, I was, I was lucky enough to get what's called an attachment. And you, you can take time out of your current job to work somewhere else in the BBC for a short time. And I suggested doing research project into the history of women in the BBC, as so little was known about this. And I spent four months finding out as much as I could and then writing several reports about it. Now, most fascinating to me were the very early years of the BBC, where I'd been surprised to discover just how important women had been to its success, whether in a programme making capacity or in a more secretarial administrative role. And this new, new knowledge then led to me studying for a part time PhD and then ultimately to an academic career here at Bournemouth University in 2012. And that was in what's, what's now called the Faculty of Media and Communication. And it's a really kind of good and interesting place to work and study because so many of the, of the academic staff members do have these pr practitioner backgrounds, which means that we can draw on our own knowledge and experience of the media industry to inform our teaching and research. Now, an important thing to stress here is that the sort of research that I do, that, that Kate Dukanian and our co colleague Christian Skirg does, is into history that is largely hidden. There is much more being done now, but when I started, there was practically nothing known about early BBC women. This has meant, and it still means, um, that using a whole array of different sources to uncover and piece together a kind of patchwork that's gradually revealing this remarkable history. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. But just to give a bit more context um, about what I found out in the original research was that in the 1920s and 1930s, the BBC really was a pioneering place for women to work. I'm sure you can't have missed that it, last year, 2022, was the centenary of the founding of the BBC. And it's hard to emphasise enough that when the BBC began, broadcasting in Britain was pretty much brand new. And I love the story about John Reith, who was appointed as the first general manager of what was then called the British Broadcasting Company. Um, and th then he went on to become the founding and legendary director general of the British Broadcasting Corporation in 1927 when it got it its Royal Charter. Um, so when he applied for the job back in 1922, he didn't even know what broadcasting was. So you have this completely new industry which had to learn about how to make radio, 
And those who came to work at this kind of fledgling BBC, both women and men, were part of this wonderful new toy, as it was often called. Now, I don't want to give the impression that there was total equality. You won't be surprised to know that men at the BBC held all the executive posts. But women did much better than in many other workplaces. So, for example, at this time, civil servants and teachers were on lower pay, pay grades than men. There were different promotional paths. And there were also marriage bars, which meant that women had to choose between having a family and having a career. Uh, now, the BBC didn't have these structures in place when it started, and it liked to portray itself as modern. So it was keen to promote this image of having equal pay and better prospects for women and no marriage bar, at least at the start. So just to give you an idea of the sorts of posts that women held in these early years, I'm talking about the three uh, the years before the Second World War, three women reached director level posts. And you've got here Hilda Matheson as Director of Talks, Mary Somerville as Director of School Broadcasting, and Isa Benzi as Foreign Director. Women also worked in a host of other product, production and administrative posts, and here are some examples. Um, so you've got in production, it could be making dramas, features, documentaries, schools programmes, children's hour. Women were in editorial positions on BBC journals like Radio Times and The Listener. They worked as accompanists, which involved playing piano in between programmes and in, also in concerts. And they worked as advertisers and press officers, as well as in more administrative posts, such as librarians, account managers and in copyright. Now, these were all salaried posts. Like most organisations at the time, the BBC had a structure of salaried and waged posts, and the majority of BBC women were waged. And so weekly wage posts were predominantly secretarial and clerical. But these were absolutely vital jobs that the BBC could not have functioned without. So it might be working in the registry, sorting the huge amounts of posts that came in every day, or filing. It could be in the telephone exchange or in, in the duplicating office. And in, there's a lovely picture there of the, one of the duplicators wearing these kind of floral overalls that they used to wear to keep their clothes clean. Um, and of course, it was doing typing or secretarial work. Now, secretarial work was highly prized at this time. So if you were secretary, that was you know, that was seen as, as a plum job. Uh, whereas being a typist was usually more mundane and was often based in the BBC's general office, which was like an early typing pool. Now, overseeing the weekly wage staff was the women's staff supervisor, later called the women's staff administrator. And this post was first held by Caroline Banks and then by Miss Freeman. And I can't tell you how long it took me to find out Miss Freeman's first name, Gwyneth. Um, but she was always called Miss Freeman. Now, one way in which the BBC did differ from many other organisations in this period was in its fluidity. So waged women were able to rise through the ranks and reach salaried posts, especially if Miss Freeman favoured you. So th these were not the typical kind of dead end jobs that were very common at this time. And the pay was, was good too. Now, I've said that this history is largely hidden. So how did I find out about it? Well, the starting point, um, for all researchers is the BBC's Written Archive Centre, which is based at Caversham out in Reading. And it's one of my absolute favourite places to be. So as well as hundreds of books and periodicals, they have more than a quarter of a million files covering things like BBC programmes and administration, which often include details of, of women. As you kind of delve in, you will find lots of things there. They also have some, some personal files. And if you're very lucky, the women you're researching might have had hers retained. Sadly, lots of, it, lots of them don't exist. And this, I'm just going to show you very quickly a, a little bit of a file of a woman called Janet Quigley. Um, so Janet, Janet Quigley, uh, who uh, she became a key figure in women's programming at the BBC. And here you can see her kind of original CV, which lists what she did, she, she did before she, she joined the BBC in 1930. It's quite important to know where people came from. And it shows that she was an Oxford graduate who'd had a variety of different jobs. Um, there's also uh, uh, the record of her career progression. She started in the, in the foreign department, um, working for Isa Benzi, who was a great friend of hers. And in 1936, she was moved to the talks department, where she specialised in women's talks. And this was something that she would, would become of even more importance during the Second World War. She had a five-year break from the BBC when she got married in 1945, but then she was persuaded to come back as editor of Women's Hour, which had then been on air for four years. And finally, she was pro promoted to a, a management post. And when she retired in 1962, she was assistant head of talks, so a very senior position. So um, 
You've, uh, you've got lots of kind of interesting letters, documents in these files, and amongst the most illuminating are the confidential annual reports. And as I'm going to see a little tiny bit of, of her uh, Janet Quibbler's report from 1937, and it's completely glowing. Just some of the words I picked out that are used to describe her. Very competent, well-balanced, sound judgment, keen hard worker, reliable, resourceful, able to take responsibility, discreet, good at handling sp speakers, has lots of ideas. So everything you'd want in a producer. And uh, in this particular year, it was decided that she should pr be promoted to salary grade B. And her salary was to go up by £40 to £540 a year. Now, that is a very high salary for a, a woman at this time. £300 a year is seen as very, very respectable salary. Um, so you have these files, but you also have another set of files, which are incredibly revealing, especially when the staff file hasn't been kept. And these are the, they're called the salary information files. And they're three large le leather bound volumes, which list the details of pretty much every one of the BBC salaried staff before the Second World War, men and women. And these have enabled me to do all sorts of comparative research because I went through and kind of took lots of the details of everybody. Uh, and this is just one, again, one entry just to show what they look like. This is the entry for Doris Arnold. You see it's got a lovely photograph of her as well, which is very helpful. Now, Doris Arnold is a captivating figure. She's kind of one of, one of the rags to riches stories of the BBC, or she's often presented in that way. So she started at the BBC in 1926. And if you can see, she was a shorthand typist in the stores department. She's earning £2.5 shillings a week. Now, that's quite a low starting wage for the BBC. So she didn't have a very auspicious beginnings. Um, then, like many typists, she was moved around various offices. And she ended up in the music department in 1927, which is where she was discovered. She was actually a very talented amateur pianist. So she became a staff accompanist in 1928 and she was promoted to the salaried grades in, 19, in 1930. And you can see how quickly she earned very well indeed. So if your wage, your salary goes up by just a few pounds, but if your salaried, it goes up by in, 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 in pounds increments, 10 pounds and 20s. And she became a very, very famous BBC star. So she's featured in magazines, on cigarette cards, she was also uh, the BBC's first female DJ. Her gramophone record programme, These You Have Loved, which started in 1938, ran for more than 30 years. And that black and white image uh, you can see of Doris Arnold comes from Radio Pictorial in 1937. And another wonderful resource for early BBC women is press cuttings. Oops, sorry. So um, this montage is just a tiny example of the sorts of press coverage that there was about BBC or women. Um, the 1920s and 30s were a real boom, boom time for female pioneers. Um, new newspapers and magazines loved to write about them and the BBC was frequently mentioned. And one of the reasons there was such a wealth of coverage was the appointment of Miss Elise Sprott as the BBC's women's press representative in 1931. And one of her jobs was to get BBC women into the papers. So you see a huge increase in articles from this time. And some of which you can see were, were written by Miss Sprott. And I always, one of my favourite headlines is Miss Sprott of the BBC takes lunch in Hull. So she became quite, you know, well known in her own right. Now, there are many other different sources that I could share with you, but I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about the BBC's oral history collection and the pioneering women website, which I co-curated, which drew on this. So this is something that's available on the BBC website, on the BBC site right, right now, which is an, it's a wonderful resource. Um, so part of the BBC's centenary commemorations was a project called 100 Voices of the BBC which used the BBC's oral history collection to tell the inside story of the corporation. This was through a number of themed websites which were published from 2017 onwards. And as I said, they're all, they're all there now. They've all been completed. Um, so the project was made in collaboration with the University of Sussex, who were the kind of academic arm. Now, the BBC's oral history collection is incredibly rich. There are more than 600 record recordings dating back to 1972, predominantly with BBC grandees as they left the corporation. Uh, and this is the pioneering, the pioneering women, women website that, that um, I um, and many others worked on, including Kate Canyon. Um, but there was an immediate problem with as we started to make this website, because only 77 of the 
interviews in the oral history collection were with women. And most of these were recorded in the past 20 years. Uh, and many others were with very random women who weren't really, re really relevant. Um, now, there were a small number of important historic interviews now, with Grace Wyndham Goldie, for example, whose, whose image you can see here. She's the main image on, on the page, Grace Wyndham Goldie. And she is the most well-known woman at the BBC, and quite rightly so. You know, she was an incredibly significant figure in using current affairs television in the 1950s and 60s. And there's lots of different interviews with her, so there's a wealth of information there. Um, but unfortunately for me, nearly all the senior BBC women of the 1920s and 30s who I've researched had died by the time that the collecting of oral histories began. Just a tiny handful uh, was still around to be recorded. One of them is uh, Janet Adam Smith, who's, um, whose image I showed a bit earlier. She was an assistant editor of The Listener in the early 1930s. Uh, it, it's a great interview. Uh, and while she was an important woman, and there were some other important women, there were none of the really significant players. So none of, the, none of the, those women who became directors, for example. Uh, this meant that when it came to writing a page like In Control, this is one of the pages of the website, um, which is about the most senior women in the BBC, I had to find creative ways to use Sound Archive. So, for example, I wanted to include Hilda Matheson on this page. Now, Hilda Matheson, uh, the BBC's first director of talks, was incredibly significant in the early years. She was responsible for professionalising and promoting the spoken word output on the BBC. This, was, this was, was at a time when everything was delivered as live talks, which were pre-scripted and rehearsed because recording technology was so rudimentary at this time. And because of, of Hilda Matheson's background and connections, she was able to entice Britain's cultural and political uh, elite to the to the airwaves. Now, my most recent research project has involved uncovering the work that Hilda Matheson did prior to joining BBC in 1926. So for the six years beforehand, she'd been political secretary to Nancy Astor MP, who was the first woman to take her seat in Parliament. Um, and it's really evident from the hundreds of letters and documents that I've kind of been looking through, just how capable and well-connected Hilda Matheson was before she came to the BBC, and she brought all this with her, so very important. Now, luckily, there were a few images of Hilda Matheson, which have been used in, in the website. Um, but it was very difficult to know how to illustrate this with sound, because, of course, there's no interview with her. But fortunately, within the Oral History Project, there was, an, it, there was one interview with a BBC executive called Charles Seatman, and he took over from Hilda Matheson following her resignation from the BBC in 1932. And he spoke very briefly about her in his Well, Hilda was a fascinating person. She had been uh, Lady Astor's secretary. We uh, relied Astor very much secretary. on her social and political connections, having again been respected at the BBC, in which she was very again, influential very indeed. Uh, she had great imagination and great drive. Her importance, and I'm so pleased that there is at least one example of her in, in that sound archi archive. Um, but there is, for me, kind of one outstanding interview in the oral history collection. So when the uh, 100 Voices project got going, there were lots of queries and questions about one of the interviewees, someone called Mrs. Bottle. So who could she be? Everybody was saying, who's Mrs. Bottle? But I knew immediately who, who this was. It was Olive Bottle, or Olive May, as she was then called who joined the BBC very early in 1923 as the first telephonist at Savoy Hill, which is where the BBC was based for its first 10 years. So if you see the, uh, this early pioneers page, um, uh, and at the top, the top of the website, um, it starts with the story of Olive May. And I was able to use a few clips from this wonderful interview. Uh, and I'm gonna play a little bit of the first, the first clip, there's three clips on, on the website, I'm gonna play a little bit of the first clip, which is where Olive describes her interview for the job, which was actually with John Reith himself. Well, the day came and, well, he, the interviewed day came and he interviewed me. He asked me various questions and then he said, I think you'll like the job. It's a very important one. You'll be rung by people from all parts of the world 
from all walks of life and often be the only contact between the BBC and them. And they must be dealt with efficiently, quickly and courteously, intelligently. So again, you can see what an important job she had because she was the kind of the initial, when you, you phoned the BBC, she was the person that you spoke to. She was the voice of the BBC at that point. Um, now, Miss May, as she would have been, been called then, became very good friends with John Reith. There are stories of them having late night cocoa together and Reith introducing grandees to her. But there was one incident that left him very, very displeased. So she fell in love with a BBC engineer who she got to know over the phone lines. This was Cecil Bottle, who was based in Leeds. And after a kind of whirlwind romance of talking over the telephone lines and letter writing, they met and very quickly got engaged. This was at the end of 1924. Um, Ruth was apparently furious about this, uh, and he even tried to stop it. Um, but he did relent, and we know that uh, know from his diaries, because he wrote copious diaries, that when Olive uh, finally left the BBC, in 1928, he gave her a, sil a silver inkstand as a parting gift, and he wrote in his diary that she had been beyond praise in every way, and I regret her going very much. Um, Olive did have a brief return to the BBC in 1932, when the telephone exchange was being installed at what was to be the, the, the BBC's new home, Broadcasting House, so she was invited back to oversee this. Now, one of the great joys of doing my research is serendipity. I've been very lucky that over the years, quite a few relatives of my BBC women have got in touch with me. And this has happened. Uh, this happened when uh, with Olive. So as part of the promotion for the website, I was interviewed on well, Woman's Hour, which is very nice. And I told the story of Olive and Cecil, and we, we, we played a little clip of her talking about it. And afterwards, a member of the family contacted the programme. Um, and you can see, so the image on the website is just of an old... Uh, switchboard because of course there was no pictures of Olive. Why would the BBC have a picture of, of Olive Bottle? But completely wonderfully, Olive's family were able to provide the BBC with some photos. So they sent these wonderful photographs in. Um, I think that's Olive in about 1924, just before she got married, and then that's at their wedding in, in 1925. And now because of these images, because these images were sent in, Olive is now very much re reclaimed as a BBC figure. And I was absolutely delighted to see her appear in the montage of faces that represent the BBC's 100 voices. So this, again, this is a part of the, of the centenary web website. There's some amazing oral history archives there, which I really recommend you to go and have a listen to. Um, so you can see Olive is there in the top row, right in the middle. So it's a you know, great joy for me to see kind of this history of the BBC women getting into the public domain. It's one of the things that is so, so wonderful. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I hope I've given you just a small glimpse into the fascinating world of early BBC women and also some, of the, some idea of how you go about researching them. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kate. That was really fascinating. There's some amazing archive <laughs> images there as well. Um, have you had many other relatives and families get in touch with you who perhaps didn't know a lot about the work that they're um, family members did at the BBC and have come to you to want to find out more about that and what's that experience been like of kind of uncovering these histories and, and yeah. helping them find out more about the people they love. It is, it is absolutely one of the uh, great joys when I, you know I'd open my email and there'd just be a little strap line it might be you know Isa Benzie or Mary Somerville and I'd open this email and, and I've had Mary Somerville's grandchildren got in touch, Isa Benzie's daughter has been in touch and um, a woman called Marjorie Waste, who I'm doing my, my current research project is now a, a woman called Marjorie Waste, who was um, she was she she was fascinating because she took over women's talks in the 30s and in the kind of early 30s, and then um, she she was very involved in, in empire talks during, during during the Second World War. So she's a really really interesting interesting person, um, and her daughter got in touch with me and um, I mean there's a very tragic story with Marjorie because. Um, she had Cecilia when uh, had Cecilia in I think 1942, um, and then and she she left the BBC at that point when Cecilia was a baby, and she had a second daughter in 1944. But tragically, um, the baby died, and then Marjorie Marjorie died. She was only in her 40s. So Cecilia was taken. Her father was a New Zealander who'd been working alongside uh, her mum in the um, Empire Talks Department. You know, when they were they were broadcasting talks all over the world and it was an incredible the, the operation because obviously um 
it never stops because the empire is, is is everywhere. So you know, when you finish in India, then it's a, then it's um, Australia, Africa. You know, it just goes round and round and round, and then you're back round the beginning. So it's it's a 24 hour operation that she was managing. It was one of the reasons she got very overtired, I think. Um, and so when uh, Mar Marjorie died, little Cecilia was taken back to um, New Zealand by her father, and they never really spoke about her mother. So it's been amazing for me to. Um, be able to share my research into Marjorie with Cecilia, but also Cecilia sent me some wonderful photographs, letters that, you know, letters and all sorts of things. So I'm going to be able to hopefully write this really rich article about her because she's, there's nothing really written about her. So it's just been, that has made it possible really for me to, 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 to do so much more research and sharing that. It's an, an incredible relationship. Um, you know, it's very, very, it's, it, it's wonderful. And it's one of the great joys of my, of my research actually. And it's brilliant that you're being able to use that to kind of give these women the spotlight that they deserve yeah. when they played such a key role in those early days and perhaps history hasn't been so kind to them but now you're you're finding these images and um, talking to relatives and, and being able to yeah shine a light on, on what they did and everything they achieved brilliant thank you so much kate um, and we'd love to hear from um, our audience this evening so do let us know in the chat if you've got any of your own memories um, of the bbc perhaps you worked there i think bill in the chat has mentioned that he worked in um, BBC External Services Bush House in the late 1960s. Um, if anyone else worked at the BBC, we'd love to hear from you. Or if you've got friends or relatives who you knew um, had roles at the BBC, please do let us know in the chat. And um, Kate Murphy will be joining us a bit later on for the discussion at the end. So please do share any questions that you have for her. And also our next speaker, Kate Tekanian, who I'm going to bring on screen now. Um, Kate is going to talk to us about the role that women played at the BBC in the Second World War. So I'm gonna hand over to you now, Kate. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about my research and that of my colleagues here at Bourne University and how it plays an important part in understanding women inside the BBC as an organization and the role they've played in that organization over time. While my colleagues, Kate Murphy and Kristen Skoog, have researched the interwar and postwar periods, my research has focused on the organization during the Second World War. Like Kate's research, I have not focused solely on the programming or the more familiar female hosts and entertainers. My interests lie more with the administrative changes that were taking place in the 1940s. While we think of the BBC in institutional terms, a national treasure, this often connotes an unmoving monolith. But I would argue that the organization was constantly evolving and is still evolving to this day. This can be due to technological changes as we're experiencing now, or the growth of the organization, as was the case during the time period I have studied. In the 1940s, the BBC's unprecedented growth was due to the need to communicate with the public about the war. As many of you may already know, the BBC did not plan to expand during wartime, and its popularity and importance as the voice of Britain was an unintended consequence of the conflict. Prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, newspapers had successfully limited the BBC's ability to report the news. The hostilities changed this dynamic and the demand for BBC news services grew. However, growth was not just in war reports, but also in entertainment. The flexibility of broadcasting and maintaining communication, boosting morale and deploying soft propaganda became quickly apparent. And as a result, the BBC sized up rather than downsized, as they anticipated would be the case. The expansion occurred in both news and entertainment with so-called observers who were proto-war reporters providing audio snapshots of life during wartime. So Audrey Russell, uh, someone who my colleague Kristen Skoog has written about, was recruited from the fire service and began working as an observer for the overseas service. First indirectly in 1941, and as a staff member in 1942. So Russell was one of the uh, few uh, BBC women war correspondents and she went, uh, she went to the continent and did reporting uh, not long after D-Day. So the General Forces program was launched with more entertainment focus. The program stream was started for soldiers at home and overseas and was particularly noted for its use of women as forces sweethearts or forces favorites intended to be, in the words of producer uh, Cecil Madden, pin-up personalities. Uh, one of the most well-known women from this service was Dame Vera Lynn, 
who hosted a popular program, Sincerely Yours. But there were many others, including Jean Medcalf, uh, Una Marson, Beryl, Beryl Davis, and Joan Gilbert. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, Christina Bada has written an excellent book called Victory Through Harmony, which in part focuses on women entertainers and hosts. So initially, the overseas service was not heard in the UK. It had started as the Empire Service, broadcasting in English across the globe, and with the lead up to the war in many different languages. The picture here is of Bush House, where the overseas service was based for many years. And while the BBC did have limited language services prior to the war, um, these were expanded from initial Arabic, Spanish, and Portuguese to include German, Italian, and French after the Munich crisis. Uh, by 1945, the, the BBC broadcast in nearly 40 different languages. In addition to becoming an integral part of the nation's public communication, the BBC also became an intelligence gathering service through the monitoring service. And this was a listening service that monitored publicly broadcast material across the globe, which was then translated and published in a digest of the material. So the BBC was also serving as what we now call an open service intelligence organization. The BBC wasn't the only organization to undergo huge uh, expansion and the available pool of labor uh, contracted as a consequence. Uh, the BBC was left scrambling to find people to fill a wide range of roles. And this situation really sparks an evolution within the corporation. One of the women who played, a, uh, one in which women played a key role. While there are many individual women I could mention, my research has focused on looking at the categories of jobs that opened up to women during the war. And tonight I'm gonna to focus on two of these areas, engineering and language associated programs. So contrary to what you might think, the BBC did not have preferred status in recruitment enjoyed by government departments or war industries. They really had to fight to recruit staff. And women, particularly young unmarried women, were the most sought after age group, and the BBC was largely restricted from recruiting from this category. And this was because women were sub subject to a labor draft, and the youngest, most able, and less encumbered women went directly into the military or into specific war-related industries. Women with modern language skills were also highly sought after by the military and the government. However, there were a few areas that the BBC was allowed some leeway and they also developed other strategies to recruit women. The first area, area, engineering, was heavily affected by labor and military drafts. And this was due to both its all-male makeup and the need for radio engineers in the military and shipping. There were very few women employed in the engineering division prior to the war and absolutely none in technical positions. While there was a good deal of behind the scenes resistance from the head of engineering, the department realized that women would need to be hired to work in control rooms and more controversially in transmitters. Uh, just a note here, uh, in 1941, uh, uh, the, the engineering establishment officer, um, Peter Florence, uh, really spearheaded the, the uh, drive to recruit women into technical roles. And he was really behind the push to get them in. And this was the one area in which uh, they were allowed to, to keep uh, this younger age cohort in. Um, so uh, control rooms were the, the first place that, that BBC uh, deployed women. They were located in main buildings and facilities across London and regions. So they were seen as a safe working uh, uh, environment. And the tasks they performed there were not much different than operating a switchboard, switchboard a, a private branch exchange, which was a feminized occupation. So engineering jobs in recording and presentation were also acceptable for similar reasons. A recording was also suitable because women's uh, so-called delicate touch and presentation, sometimes called program uh, engineering, also used women who had a musical background or a dramatic flair. However, recording and program engineering were much smaller sections of the engineering division and the need for more staff was most acute on transmitters. Transmitters were the largest section of engineering prior to the war, but the expansion of broadcasting in scope and in broadcast hours required greater transmission capacity and therefore much larger staffs. 
getting women on transmitters caused uh, a more protracted debate within engineering management. And this was because transmitters were often in remote locations, required shift work, and were not deemed suitable for mixed sex makeup. Prior to the war, even secretarial and cleaning staff on transmitters were men. This was overcome in two ways, by making sure that a woman and a man did not work alone together, and by assigning women to smaller H group transmitters. Now these were backup transmitters that were often located in strange places. Uh, one was underneath the, the, uh, the, the pools, the baths in uh, Ipswich, but they were used, uh, to, used in air raids to split transmission signal to confuse enemy bombers. And they were also intended as emergency transmitters in case of a full scale invasion. They were only big enough to staff two to three people. And in these locations, women were supposed to work in pairs. The age group transmitters were undemanding and seen as a bit of a dead end for training and promotion purposes. But the work there wasn't that much different from what was on offer at larger facilities. Uh, women who studied mathematics or scientific subjects were seen as good candidates for engineering jobs. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, those with musical training or dramatic background were also seen as suitable. The BBC provided a comprehensive course, some of which was on the job, to make up for a lack of formal engineering background. The training school helped uh, what the BBC termed as dilutees. So these are people with limited broadcast engineering knowledge or experience. Uh, the school was there to help them get up to BBC standards, which were always high. Uh, the term included both men and women, and the school had been uh, established and, and handled mixed sex cohorts, which ultimately lasted three months and included classroom and practical training. Women were also included in promotion schemes, but the management was confident that few would have qualification to rise above junior levels. And this was certainly true, as many engineering training schools and university programs did not admit women. The focus was on ensuring women could fill operational roles, which had fewer prerequisites pre -requ and which women were more than capable of doing. And by operational roles, I mean day-to-day -day activities around transmission. This could include cleaning valves, patching programs, monitoring levels, and making sure things went out on time. While time does not permit me to cover all the areas where women's uh, reach expanded, I will briefly touch on another area where women were able to serve in a variety of capacities. And this uh, was in the language dependent BBC services. Because of the BBC charter and its broadcasting agreement with the government, uh, it included a provision that excluded hiring foreign staff in certain positions. Mostly they were hired as contract workers. Uh, women became attractive candidates. And one of the reasons was that women were more likely to have studied modern languages as these skills were seen as more useful in commercial contexts. And university graduates who in the 1930s and 40s were predominantly men were more likely to have studied classical languages and literature. Uh, this held true for university educated women as well. So the BBC also turned to foreign nationals living in the UK, many of whom were refugees. The second reason was that women who were native speakers had a greater chance of having UK citizenship, making them eligible for a greater variety of roles. Uh, at the time, women automatically gained citizenship upon marrying a UK citizen, whereas men had to go through a naturaliz uh, naturalization process. In fact, a British woman who married a foreign born man automatically lost her citizenship. During wartime, citizenship considerations were relaxed for women who had lost their citizenship through marriage and they too were eligible for more responsible positions within the BBC language services. These questions of citizenship were important, especially in the monitoring and languaging services. Supervisors and positions like switch sensors, these are people who could switch off microphones if the speaker is deviated from the script, needed to be UK citizens. And women with language skills were more likely to have citizenship through marriage. Women were also import so important to the functioning of the monitoring service, for instance, that a children's hostel was established to care for children of women working at the service in Cavisham near Reading. This was an extraordinary provision, even during wartime. 
In my last few minutes here, I would like to speak to this narrative of what happens in the post-war BBC. How did the experience of using women for the first time in these technical roles in the engineering division, for instance, impact the corporation going forward? With much of the research on women workers in the Second World War, the debate often centers on the issue of what happened to women training in non-traditional fields after the conflict. Did they happily move on to other jobs? Did they protest their removal? Did some of them manage to hang on? Did management push them out? And you can find more than enough studies that answer yes to all of these questions. But I also think there was a moment where the direction of the BBC eventually took to exclude women again from engineering posts was not inevitable. So women did remain in program engineering, and these were jobs working in studios, controlling microphones, creating sound effects. Um, and this is a photo of a woman working in a continuity suite in 1961. So the continuity suite was a, um, a place where, where someone would uh, transfer from one program to the other, a, a bit of a handoff. Uh, sometimes there would be a, a, a bit of a voiceover. And I like to imagine that the woman in the photo uh, joined the BBC in the 1940s and that she's still working there. But women were also a large part of the London Transcription Service, which dealt with sending and receiving programming from overseas. And many women who worked in the wartime engineering division transferred to this service. They also remained active in engineering in the overseas service for an extended period of time. So when television re relaunched in 1946, many women became vision mixers. So this was like the television counterpart to the program engineer. Uh, women also operated studio cameras. The squeezing out came later and it was not immediate or universal choice. Voices within engineering division and the corporation in general, general noted that women had proved themselves and that the organization should be fair to them and continue to allow them to perform technical jobs. Uh, this did happen in program engineering, but other avenues were cut off. Uh, program engineering, uh, however, eventually was moved out of the engineering division altogether. While women were not made redundant, uh, in engineering, they were transferred off transmitters uh, to usually to at first to control rooms uh, in London, uh, and then they were subject to limitations in promotion. This was done through regrading and test-based promotion. Uh, the re one of the the um, areas at the the the, the, the overseas service they did stay there a little bit longer because those jobs weren't regraded, but they were regraded in the in the London control room a little bit earlier. Um, but the test-based promotion, these were tests you could take after completing BBC training, training which you could only attend if your supervisor recommended to you. So there was a lot of gatekeeping. Uh, once it was clear that television was the future prestige end of broadcasting in the 1950s, the roles that women had initially filled were also restricted and reorganized in a way that made employing women difficult. Despite this discouraging environment, some women hired during the war did persist and were promoted and eventually did obtain supervisory roles, but in very small numbers. Of the nearly 1,000 women recruited to engineering during the war, seven hung on in the engineering division until the retirement in the 1970s. Um, it's difficult to know if there were more of these women stayed with the BBC because they would have moved on to other departments. The monitoring service, which is still an active organization, discontinued its extraordinary children's hostel in 1947 after repeated delays uh, when the lease on the premises in Sonning Bridge was released. But the, also over that period of time, they right, right at the end of the war, they quit taking on new children. Uh, so uh, the, the pool of children there kept shrinking. Its closure, uh, the, the hostel's closure was linked to the changing recruiting environment at the war's end, uh, the, the, need not, the need not to, uh, the, there was a greater pool of people available who could work there. And there was also a reluctance to continue this benefit, seeing it as one BBC administrator described as the thin edge of the wedge. So while this story is somewhat of an evolution within the organization, it's also an example of how progress is a choice that organizations have to actively make and continue to support. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you, Kate. That's um, really interesting. Did you have the chance to speak to any of these people over the course of your research? And, and what was that experience like? Uh, I did interview uh, some some people early on in my research. So when I first started doing this, uh, so I was taking oral histories uh, when uh, when I was really new to it. Uh, so some of the things I wished I'd asked, I, I, I could have asked at the time, but I really did have a chance to talk to at least eight people who had been uh, working at the BBC during the war, uh, some in engineering. And I, 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 my very first interview was a, with a woman engineer, and uh, she was really a fantastic interviewee. So uh, I just I loved her descriptions. There was one particularly nice moment when she was talking about her early years as a child, um, listening on a crystal set. And it was really lovely to listen to her story. And then she told me one of her first experiences had been playing records in a department store in, in, uh, in the town where she was from. And she was really a lovely uh, interviewee. And so for her to take that passion to use it at the BBC, I assume, um, was a great experience for her. Yeah, I re one of the things that was really interesting about her was that um, she had studied dramatics. She hadn't gone to university yet. I'm not even sure she had a school school leaving certificate, but she had studied dramatic dramatics, and she's obviously very good at it. And I I like to think that 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 her her role working in a department store, doing the a kind of an in house sort of DJ role, um, would have set her in in good position. She was one of the she she was one of the first cohorts to train, so she trained in the summer of 1941, um, and she just had a really lovely story about her time there. Uh, she told me about being up on the uh, being up on the roof um, during the Blitz. That it was a, a quiet place to go sometimes when when she was working because she worked down in the basement at um, at the London control room, which was deep, deep underground. Um, where I guess it was safe, but it was a bit claustrophobic. Strangely enough, uh, that uh, she did mention that her um, her direct, well, the, the big boss of the London control room was Cecil Bottle, uh, the person, <laughs> the husband of, of Olive Bottle that Kate Murphy was talking about earlier. That's a very nice segue into bringing um, Kate Murphy back for our discussion. Um, so we'll answer some of your questions this evening. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to pop any questions that you have um, using the question um, icon that we have on screen. But um, I think first, it would be good to just think about the context of the time and actually some of the barriers and obstacles that women might have faced in um, the workplace um, during this time. I mean, women had only just really got the vote and now they were producing political programming. So what sort of barriers were there to women in the workplace and what sort of obstacles might they have to have overcome to reach these really powerful and important positions um, at the BBC? Perhaps Kate Murphy, if we come to you first. Yeah. I mean, also, in, in, they hadn't actually gotten the vote because uh, some women had got the vote in 1918, but the, the full vote wasn't until 1928. So lots of these young women wouldn't have been able to vote when they started at the BBC. So that's something just, just to, to bear in mind. There were still lots and lots of things that needed to happen. Um, so, yes, that, what, one thing that's quite interesting and yet that you that you see quite very this is with, with, with the women who are salaried. So the BBC did say it had equal pay. For example, and that and that is that is true in the sense that they had there was a starting wage. So I think it was um, a, the kind of basic starting wage salary was two hundred and sixty pounds a year. And that sounds that it's crazy to think of that, but actually that's that was a very a, a good salary at the time, two hundred sixty pounds a year. So that was the basic starting rate. And you see, we're, we're women coming in and being offered two hundred sixty pounds a year, and they're absolutely amazed that they're going to earn so much money. Um, so they, they, there's no question they would dream of asking for anything else they're just gonna they're amazed i'm gonna pay 260 pounds a year it's so incredible but you but you know that that, that men coming in um I, I they either might have been offered higher salaries or they would negotiate higher salaries so they already would come in with sort of you know a, a, a currency and, a, and a, you know an understanding of, of how these things worked which which women didn't have so often women earn much earn less then you get you do get interesting examples. Um, for example, Mary Adams, who became the first woman television producer in 1937. Um, she came in in 1930. She she was a, an older woman, very experienced, and she negotiated a very good starting salary. Um, and by the time she, I think it was about six hundred pounds a year, I think she started on. By the time she moved over to te television, she was on eight hundred pounds a year, which is a very very high salary at that time. Um, 
And of course, you've got these young men coming in who are on about 350 a year or 300 a year. So she's on a much, much higher salary than they are. So you get these anomalies as well. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to see. Um, but you know, there, there are lots of examples of women taking in some areas, having managers who, who took years and years and years and years to kind of reach those salary grades um, or who, who were doing the, you know, doing very, you know, if, um, lots of lots of secretaries. There's what there are wonderful um, stories about, you know, um, secretaries kind of doing lots of the work of the chaps. They'd be all up, they'd be all having lunches and you know, creative, and, you know, being all creative. And the women, their secretaries, were doing so much of the, you know, booking and all this, you know, lots and lots of the actual work. But obviously, they didn't get that credit. So it's an interesting. It's really interesting to kind of try and unpick what was actually happening, but see how they, you know, there was a chance that they could make that. You know, there was an ability to to get on. Um, if they, you know, we, we had good fortune, I suppose, and, and were able. So, so also pay is an issue. Uh, uh, at the end of the Second World War, there's a, a Royal Commission on Equal Pay, and the BBC has a, a pretty extensive file about um, uh, that has a report that they they submitted for this Royal Commission, and they do they do congratulate themselves. Uh, that they they pay equal, except in a couple of areas. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it it had something to do with uh, uh, tape runners or something like that. That they didn't quite pay them the same amount, or it, it could have been lift operators. There were it, it tended to, they tended to focus on the the differences in the lower grades. Oh, for instance, they didn't pay cleaners or porters the same because uh, the 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 men cleaned above their the waist and the women did lower so it's uh, something to do with heavy lifting uh, and that 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 made sure that you you got a lower wage if you didn't lift as much weight um uh but uh, they did note uh, in this file that perhaps they hadn't given people the opportunity to advance so it's the the same it, even though they were saying they were paying them equal, that they did recognize the fact that, that there weren't, there wasn't the same advancement um, opportunities. And I, I see there's a question here on um, on our our things from Julia Taylor, and I I, I want I want to think that this issue kind of uh, her question, which is, to, is there any extent evidence about how women felt about these restrictions imposed on them, kind of. Uh, goes into this this issue about equal pay, and I think about um, Claire Lawson Dick. She's one of the people that there is a an oral history interview for, and she is quite critical. And she does in her interview does discuss um, her frustrations, and you you can see this in her personnel file. She's desperately trying to advance. Uh, she starts she starts working at the BBC in the 30s, and she's desperately trying to advance. She's clearly very intelligent, and she does rise to a really high level. Uh, but um, she is kind of frustrated with the 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 um, limitations that she sees are being put on women in the organization. And we haven't mentioned the marriage bar either, which is no. really such a big, enormous thing that when the BBC did introduce a marriage bar um, in 1930, they discussed it in 1932 and it came in in 1933. So this is, this is something that both Kate and I have done a lot of work on in different ways. So, you know, that, that and the BBC, the way the BBC had of this marriage bar, because I think it wanted to, because marriage bars were very common, the BBC wanted to be seen as being respectable. You know, it was this kind of era of it, it kind of positioning itself as this kind of very respectable authority, you know, the force of authority, all these things. Um, so a marriage bar was seen as part of that kind of, th that image. Uh, but it was, it was quite canny because, it it didn't want to get rid of women who were really really fantastic. Um, so they had a marriage tribunal where women could present a case, and you know they if you were exceptional, there were lots of criteria that you could you could have the chance to stay on. So it's kind of a, quite an interesting story that the, the marriage bar and how that you know that definitely discriminated against women and m many women. You know they because it was there they didn't you know they did they wouldn't go to the tribunal. They would just take the decision to leave. Having said that, most women did when they got married. That was the kind of cultural expectation anyway at the time. And Tim has asked, how did women's roles at the BBC compare to other media organisations or newspapers? Were the BBC actually quite progressive in comparison or was this um, quite typical for the time? Well, I haven't, there's not been a lot of comparative work actually, interestingly. Um, I think, you know, women were doing quite well on, on, on newspapers and magazines. Um, but again, often it was in on the women's pages, you know, these, so it's a bit like in, in and the BBC, 
we're women excelled in women's talks and things. They were in other areas, but of course, women's programming was where's where they were obviously were excelling, and that's similar in, in newspapers and, and magazines. But there were, you know, there were women, women war correspondents. There were women doing other things, definitely. Uh, so I think, yeah. But again, you know, newspapers they 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 were their own bosses in a way. It's it's the more kind of it's the more the professions like you know teaching, civil service, banking, nurse, nursing. The kind of these professions that they were they were much more problematic for women. I think. Um, you know, they're different sort of industries because they, it, because you're kind of freelance in a way, not freelance, but you you negotiate your own salaries and all sorts of things. So there, there was more equality in in those industries, definitely. Would you agree, Kate? Is that something that you see? Yeah, I would. I would say I, you know, I haven't really looked so much at uh, newspapers. Uh, I know there's been a, uh, well, I've done some looking at uh, the difference between uh, the civil service, for instance, and the BBC. Um, uh, structure uh, one one woman that worked at the um at the bbc during the war who rose to be uh really important in television this is um joanna spicer um she started working at the bbc she had been working as a, a kind of a, a junior civil servant and she started working at the bbc because they paid more it's very clear in her records she says i you know she she she's moving the bbc because they're offering her an equal salary to a man and much higher than they're paying at at civil service in civil service the civil service routinely paid women uh, i think 20 to 30 percent less than than men for equivalent positions so and you, um, you, you see that in reverse when women at, at the beginning of the war are moving over to work for the ministry of information and things that they're, they're very shocked that they're getting paid these high salaries and so they have they have to take pay cuts to, to go to, to work in when they're kind of called up to go and work in the ministry of information and things so there's that, that is definitely true but um Media industry is really interesting. Yeah, so at Bletchley, even they, a lot of the women that worked at Bletchley were actually in the military, and they were paying them very little. These these young women that were highly skilled. Um, <laughs> and that leads nicely into Robin's question, actually, around whether women served in any military capacity. So, um, I suppose we're talking about the BBC in this lecture. But what sort of role did that monitoring station play in kind of intelligence and kind of the military response um, during the war? Uh, so, uh, there were lots of women who were listeners for the military. They did very similar things, but they were listening to different types of, of, uh, uh, conversations. So they would be listening to, um, I suppose the, the sort of, uh, chatter you'd hear between, uh, people on an, uh, a bombing raid. So the German, they would be listening in, in German. So the, the military did also need a lot of, of, uh, people who had those kinds of language capacities. And they were usually frequently young women who, who already knew the language for whatever reason. Um, there, of course, also the, the BBC had uh, the home guard, uh, but I don't think that women were allowed to, to serve in it. I don't, I don't they, really quite. They were, there, there was, there was a women's, there was a women's home guard, BBC home guard itself. Yeah. I, I remember oh, there's a woman right. called Nora Pidding. I, think, I remember re reading about someone called Nora Pidding. So the BBC had its own little home guard. Okay. So, yeah, they certainly did fire washing too yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a part of your duties. So, uh, but with the monitoring service, very interesting because um, I, I, I suppose that the BBC had the, 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 they got the remit to do it because they had the, the capacity to um, intercept the transmissions. Uh, but it was the BBC who was who was running the organization, and they they still do. So it is this kind of connection with the military work that that isn't strictly about broadcasting, uh, and really interesting uh, to think about this this kind of uh, how how open source intelligence worked in the nineteen in the nineteen forties. But, they, but there's also I think with with the BBC it was also very much about home front morale wasn't it and kind of mm. soft diplomacy so i know the work i'm looking at marjorie marjorie waste now and so she became director of empire talk so this very important role and again it was this way of, of how to present britain to the empire to kind of encourage people to come you know uh, to understand what's happening uh, you know to kind of, i suppose it was just this idea of bringing the world in to understand what was happening in in the war and how it was impacting and how those sorts of things so that so the bbc played this really important role in in bringing the country together. I mean, I don't know masses about the war, but you know, you, you, there's definitely a sense that the BBC, as we know, plays, played a really, really important part 
in, in, in the war in, in many ways. Yeah, certainly in, in morale and um, uh, just, just through, even just through entertainment that, that really helped get people through. And, and there were lots of pro there were lots of programs. I mean, the forces, the women's forces, particularly um, some of the programs that they that were broadcast were for the forces, but also for, for women in the forces. So, or women in the factories, um, as well as women in the homes. So mm -hmm. they, you know, they were targeting that whole range. And you mentioned the BBC Home Guard. What role did they play? What what did they do during that time? That was, I mean, this when I did that very very initial report, which is going back twenty years. Um, and I just it just saw something that really struck me because um, they produced a, there's, a little, there's a staff night journal aerial which is also a fantastic source for, for BBC history which started in 1936 so it's the kind of the staff journal and it, it was produced in a very little form during the war just a little kind of version but there was just a wonderful photograph I remember seeing of women in the BBC Home Guard mm. and and I just remember Nora, Nora Pidding maybe she maybe she was the one who organized knitting socks for soldiers or something but um this idea that, that you could feel that you were doing your bit, like Kate was saying, the fire watching, so that you know you were also a BBC employee, but you were also doing your your bit for the for the war effort as well. It's that, just very find out more about that. It'd be interesting. Yeah, it's a, a just a very common thing. People uh, people did wear a lot of uniforms and in many many different um, uh, things that you wouldn't think they would have uniforms, like the Women's Voluntary Service, they had uniforms as well. And they were they were all about, you know, being part of doing your part for the war effort. Um, a couple of questions about the actual process of your research. So um, Kate Tokanian, um, Gwen has asked, what sort of places do you get your information from? Oh, uh, well, so the, the archive at Cavisham as well. I have used lots of different things uh, too. I, I've, I've looked at Ancestry. I've gotten in touch with people through Ancestry.com. Uh, I've used the, um, the there, there wasn't a census during the war, but there was a kind of uh, a sort of mini census uh, uh, that was done in 1940, I think 1941. And I've used that to find out people's names. So BBC files are really fabulous, but everybody is just either their job title or you get their first initial. So you never know what their full names are. Um, so I, I cross-checked uh, the census, uh, uh, the census with their people's names. And a lot of times they had written in the margin that they worked at the BBC. So I knew I had found my right person. Um, I've, I've read memoirs. There, are people, there, there aren't that many memoirs by women who worked at the BBC, but there are one or two where you can get snippets uh, from uh, uh, the, the files that I've looked at the files at the National Archives as well. They're, they're, they're a good supplement. They, you get to see the other side of it, how the civil service views the, v, the BBC and their requirements. Um, but yeah, I, I would say the bulk of, of our, re and I've done interviews too, but the bulk of our research is always at the at Cavisham, at, at the, the Written Archive Center in, um, in, for the BBC. And Tim has said the, um, the archives look fascinating to explore, but are there any questions that you haven't been able to solve through looking through these archives? So I'm okay. still want to know. <laughs> there, there are, I mean, it, it, the archive is what's being, what's, what's being kept. So it's very frustrating that, you know, so Hilda Matheson, there is no file for her, for example. Um, and so that makes it very, very difficult. You know, you have, you know, so you have to kind of piece her life together, the BBC from all sorts of everything else, because there, there's no, no file. And Elise Sprott, who I'm very, very fond of, there's no file. And there's that she when Marjorie Wace comes in, um, she comes in to kind of as an assistant to Elise Sprott when when Hilda Matheson is, is director of talks. And we know that um so Marjorie Wace is an Oxford graduate and very erudite and intellectual. And Elise Sprott is much more one of the kind of the, the doughty women who hadn't been to university, a very different sort of woman and a bit older. You can, obviously there's some sort of clash. And and um, there's there's lots of, there's there's things in Reese Starry about how you know Miss um, Sprott's is, is had to be moved because you know there's, there's some sort of thing and see Miss Sprott's file it says and you think I can't see Miss Sprott's file it doesn't exist so you know that things happen and you have to kind of piece them in from other places so going to the archive is incredible when you find you know come um, come across um, all sorts of amazing things but it is limited um, and you just have to kind of you know piece it together from all sorts of bits, going through lots of different files and 
Uh, you have to know what you, for example, though the, the, the salary information files, I, I was very lucky. I had a, a very wonderful archivist who came and gave them to me because I wouldn't have found them by looking through the BBC. Because um, often, as Kate says, sometimes the files are quite difficult. It, it's not clear what they're going to have in them and people's initials and, and job titles. It's kind of really get your head around it. So, you know, a bit of help from the arch archivist is also very, very welcome. Yes, sometimes I would figure out who the who the um, who was actually writing the memo because the, the, they would switch jobs. So, you know, the, the head of whatever would be uh, somebody else a month later. You go, oh, this this tone of this memo sounds really different. And the only way I could figure it out was to look down at the bottom of the page because I understood how typists do things. Uh, they would always put the the initial of the the person who who. who um, who dictated the memo and then their initial next to it um, in, in smaller letters after a slash. So that was a that was a cue. And then you would have to figure out, OK, whose initials are these? Um, there was one woman I was looking uh, for more information about a producer named Nesta Payne, so who, who I've written an article about. And uh, I thought, oh, she she must have some files. Um, um, she lived quite a long time, and then unfortunately, her daughter died a few years after she did. So I was wondering maybe what her daughter had done with the papers, and I was looking around and looking around. And then I finally found this section in the the BBC archives at, at, at Cavisham that said uh, that said her name next to it, or actually, I think it said uh, her daughter's name. And the, lo and behold, her daughter had left had put all the papers, her mother's papers, at the archives. So they've got boxes and boxes of these. But they're not in the regular um, regular archive uh, catalog, I suppose. Not in the, it's not cataloged in the same way. So that is a treasure trove, a treasure trove of information. In that she had an unpublished autobiography. Uh, wasn't so much about her personal life, but she talks um, a lot about her her life as a as a as a as a producer, and that is really valuable. You don't really usually get these kinds of reflections about people's thoughts on their 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 professional life. Uh, so it was really, really great to be able to access that. And is there anything that you've found in these archives that you've been surprised by or weren't expecting or have kind of led you on a kind of unintended path um, through the course of your research? Well, in my case, it was actually when I did that very, very original research, it was finding these marriage bar files because I'd never even heard of a marriage bar. I, had, I didn't I didn't even know what it was. And um, it absolutely amazed me. Um, and they were just, they were so rich in just what it said about women's lives um, at that time. And especially when you read the actual tribunal records, it gave you all sorts of information about how women lived and, and how they valued their jobs. Also, there was just, it was just such a rich resource, but, and, but so incredibly unexpected um, to see kind of, and also quite, shocking sometimes to see how they were kind of manipulated how things were, were manipulated behind the scenes and I, I found that file so incredible and that's really what started me on my journey of actually wanting to go further into the BBC that was my kind of first thing really yeah I think one of, one of my favorite things uh, about looking at the files I know this isn't quite what you asked uh, but we get to look at people's personnel files uh, within GDPR, GDPR bounds, and usually at the back of them, there's a photograph of them. So uh, it's really nice to look at these different photographs of people and what they've picked out. Um, and to, well, I, they probably were just given; they they probably took them themselves, and which ones they selected, and how they looked. Um, it, it really kind of humanizes it, and it's really interesting to read their their um, yearly reviews, because sometimes you'll be reading someone's, oh, she's wonderful, she's wonderful, she's wonderful, and then all of a sudden there's this bad review, and then you don't really know what happens, and it's really hard to kind of figure out, and then it's back to, to normal, but sometimes it's, it's this just kind of inconsistency, I suppose. Um, and picking up on your um, presentation, Kate, uh, to Kavian, um, Tim's asked, was there a point after the 50s where it seemed like women had kind of recovered the significant roles that they held in the 30s and 40s and, and during the war? I, I don't really think it's till the 70s till they start really making any effort to recruit women into these roles. And that's late in the 70s. It's kind of interesting. I, I think... I think there's this idea that women didn't do these jobs, and then when you when you go back and 
and particularly camera operating, when you go back and say, actually, uh, in, in uh, you know, just after the war, they were camera operators. I've just been reading a book uh, that I just, I just picked up uh, that's called The Small Screen. And it was written by this woman talking about her, her role as a producer. And it was written in the 1950s. And she's going through talking about sort of a, a typical variety program. And, and she's referring to people in their job roles and she does use use him or her or they, and you can tell by her language uh, which which jobs are are still gendered male or perhaps they're they're sometimes they might be women. But then she talks about vision mixers, and she clearly says the vision mixers are women. Um, so at what point does that change? Um, but when there, there's there is an incredible report that comes out in 1973. So the BBC, so once kind of, the, the BBC it has always seen itself as modern. And then there, there's a book that comes out called Women in Top Jobs, I think in 1969. Anyway, so that's sort of period, 1970. And they and they, that's when they start to show that the civil service is actually more progressive than the BBC by this point. Uh, and, and the BBC, then there are lots of kind of women's liberation kicks off and there's lots of, you know, they start to kind of saying, hey, what's happening at the BBC? And there's this report that the BBC do into them, them into the we're women. And it's absolutely shocking. I mean, if you read this report, that is that was one of the moments that I could not believe my what I was seeing. Um, the level of kind of misogyny and 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 as Kate was saying, you know, these we're women who've been doing engineering, suddenly they they were too weak, they were incapable. There was all sorts of reasons why women couldn't do these jobs anymore. Um, and then it, that's after that, that they start to do some more, more reports. There's a Sims report that comes out, I think, in 1986, 85. Then they get, I, when I joined in 87, they just got the e first Equal Opportunities Officer in place. And then things started, you know, to move. But they didn't have the first woman on the board, the man in the board of management until 1990. So, you know, it's kind of, it, it was progressive. And then it kind of does have this kind of real bit when it seems to have gone, well, it just didn't keep up with other other organizations, really. Mm. It, and I think that's the, a really interesting point is that is that they they did change. They, it, they were progressive and and they they got re regressive, I suppose, particularly in television. Um, that they they were even saying in the in the late forties, early fifties. Well, you know, actually, women can handle these cameras. They're not that heavy anymore. They're not like they used to be. Um, but then they made these job requirements uh, that would that only men would fill, uh, and then they 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 wouldn't divide up the the positions. You you had to be able to do all of the things, um, even the things they restricted women from. So therefore, women couldn't be hired for it. So they they do make these they they make a choice. Um, so it's interesting to see how long it takes to reverse those choices. Um, Irina has asked, how long did it take you to complete your research and have you got any key tips that you'd give to future historians or, or journalists wanting to look into this area? It, well, it, it's ongoing. I mean, it, it doesn't stop. I mean, it's just, I, I, it, it's my favourite thing. It's just absolutely, you know, it's just the, just the biggest joy because, and Kate will know this, you know, as you as she's saying, you go through these files, you get to know these people, you see what they look like, you know, you 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 uncovering these amazing lies. And you want to, you know, you want to write about them. You want to kind of get them into the public domain. And, um, you know, I'm just really looking forward to finish. You know, I just want, I've got some women I want to finish off writing about, you know, because it's just so important to, to get them to do that research and keep going. Because it's not, you know, it's in here. Obviously, it doesn't help anybody to have it in here. You need to, you need to, you need to write it down or speak about it so that you can share, share what you learn. But I think it's just, you know, the only tip is just go, you know, just, it, love it and you know they it, it's once you start it, it gives you clues as you go along you know because you know Kate was saying you find you know you you learn learn how to read you understand the initials and that you get to know the con context and you can just build, build up more and more and get more and more knowledgeable so it's a very nice place to be yeah I would say the same it would never end I, I think when I when I first started doing the research about the second world war I thought I could cover a lot more than I ended up being able to cover in my um, PhD. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's just an enormous topic. Uh, there's other areas that I, I really haven't even had a chance to look at. So like the London Transcription Service, I've, 
I've never really had a chance to, to look at it more fully. That was almost fully staffed by women because it was a new service during the war. Um, so that was very uh, female heavy. Um, there is also some, something else to look at is a lot of the intelligence officers that worked in the language services. Uh, they were almost all women. Uh, so there's a story there <laughs> that needs to be told, but it's, uh, I, it just, I guess it, the, the more you look at it, the bigger it becomes. Uh, so, And I really enjoy the, the other thing I really love is the kind of networking. Because I, I mentioned that uh, when Janet Quigley came into the BBC, she came to work for Azabenzi, who would become the, the foreign director. So she recommended her best friend for, for, the, for a job, the job. And in the early days, that's how everybody, you know, that's how people got in, really. Word of mouth was a really important way of getting in. In fact, interestingly, when they bring in 1934, when they bring in official um, uh, boards, um, recruitment boards, what they're called, not admission boards. Anyway, you know, so these official, official boards you have to go through to get jobs. That's when women start to go down, interestingly, because then they start to recruit men. It's kind of an interesting, interesting turning point, actually. Uh, at that point, as, as the BBC gets more pr professionalised, but the networks are so amazing to see how women kind of get get on or don't get on, and, and you know use those networks, uh, and not just in the BBC, but kind of you know in other places as well. So it's a really there's just so many different avenues you can head down. Trying to choose what is is the is the issue often. Um, and Tim has asked, is there any possibility of crowdsourcing information from living relatives, as has happened already, um, but on a bigger scale? Have you thought about kind of proactively going out and, and trying to find people who might have known or been related to these people at the BBC? You might do, Kate, because you're much better at that sort of thing than I am. Yeah, I would love to. I've, I've, I've really wanted to, but it, it is kind of a hard a hard thing to find a, a platform where, where people would look, I suppose. Um, that that's always the, I love the idea of crowdsourcing. I really do, uh, it, and I envy people who are able to launch these big projects. Uh, although I would say, anytime any one of us has any kind of thing published or something, uh, there's a press release. Hopefully, it will happen after tonight. Uh, somebody does get in touch with us, um, and it's it's always great to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And it's quite nice for, because also we share, you know, that between uh, Christian, who has been able to, to join us tonight, we, the three of us, you know, we, we share our research. We kind of, you know, we, we do so, so many things together. So, you know, I think that the sums of the three of us is also something that's really important that, that, we, that we have this kind of little unit of, our, of the three of us doing this really, really interesting research. So. And we're almost out of time, so I'm going to wrap tonight's event up with one final question. Obviously, given the title of this talk, Pioneering Women at the BBC, is there one particular woman um, who's particularly inspired you? Um, perhaps Kate Murphy, if we come to you first. Well, I, at the moment, I'd have to say, so I'm obviously just starting Marjorie Waste, so she'll become my new, <laughs> new one. But Hilda Matheson is so incredible. And I just had been very lucky that um, the biography, the biography that in fact, it was her biography that really inspired me when I was working at Woman's Hour um, and her biography came in. And that's, you know, I, and I, I just got really inspired to, to know that someone, a woman had done this amazing, had been director of talks um, and that kind of kicked off my, my research, really. Um, so now that book, that book, that's being republished and I've written a big essay to go with it, which is when I did all this extra research into Hilda before she came to the, so I'm calling her Hilda because I feel like I know her. But anyway, so she is just such an inspiring person and to have, to have the chance to find out more about her that, that no people don't know uh, and, uh, and get that written, it's, it's just very, very exciting. So she is just an amazing person, you know, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's really kind of several women producers that I, I've looked at, and well, not not, not just the producers, but I, I guess I can find out more about them because they definitely do have personnel files. Um, and I've looked at uh, this one, Nesta Payne, who I mentioned earlier. Um, but there's also a couple that I'd, I'd like to know more about. Um, uh, one of them is Gen Jennifer Wayne. Uh, she worked uh, during the the um, war. And she was kind of this up and coming young producer, but she married a BBC war correspondent and and then uh, left to have a family. Um, so it, it'd be interesting to know a little bit more about her professional life as well. Nesta Payne is a really interesting woman, too, because uh, she did. Uh, she was university educated. She'd gone to the um, 
uh, University of Liverpool and um, then had done some graduate work at, at Oxford. Uh, I, I don't think she ended up finishing her degree, but uh, then she she starts working at the BBC in the mid 40s when she's close to 40 herself. So as far as I can tell, this is the first kind of job she has and how she makes a career there. And she seems like at first she's very frightened and and um, her her supervisor doesn't like her very much and she almost gets fired. They, they've got a letter in her file that says, fire her, fire her. And then and then the next the next thing, just like days before it's about to happen, they say, no, cancel that. She's yeah, she's she's doing these these shows now for us and we like her. Um, so she I find her very fascinating, really. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. It's amazing how much you've been able to find out about these women and, and thank you both so much for joining us this evening and for sharing their stories um, with us this evening as well. Um, that's all we've got time for, so I'm going to wrap up here. Um, a big thank you both to um, Dr Kate Murphy and Dr uh, Kate Turk uh, Turkanian, <laughs> nearly got there, <laughs> um, for your time this evening and for joining us and thank you to our audience as well for coming along and um, for engaging with us for asking such brilliant questions i've really enjoyed tonight's event um, and i hope you have too um, we'll be sending out a follow-up email um, following the event this evening um, just with some more information and links to some of the research and resources that have been mentioned so please do keep an eye out for that if you want to find out more about any of the things we've discussed this evening um, and there'll also be a feedback survey as part of that email as well so we'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out and let us know how you found tonight's event it just helps us to ensure that we're putting on the best events possible. This event is part of our online public lecture series, which is showcasing Bournemouth University research and the impact that it's having on the world around us. Um, you can find out more about other events in this series by clicking on the green button that's appeared on your screen now, or by visiting the Bournemouth University website. Our next event will be on the 18th of May, and we'll look at how Bournemouth University research is helping to uncover some of the history um, and secrets of Stonehenge. That's it from us this evening. Um, so we'll be closing this event now, but the chat will remain open if you want to share any final thoughts or comments. Um, and you'll also be able to um, use the link that you um, joined with this evening to um, come back and watch the recording of tonight's event as well. So big thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>